Someone who felt stuck or trapped like I was, living a miserable life, thinking that when they make X amount of money, when they get to a certain level in their career, that they're going to be happy. They keep <coughs> getting quite emotional about this, but they keep putting it off and putting it off, thinking that later is the time to do it, when later may never come. I've been having a lot of thoughts recently about where I'm currently at, the direction I'm going in, and I'm really grateful for what I'm doing at the moment. I wanted to make this video for someone who perhaps was like how I was in my previous life. Someone who is looking for a bit more meaning, a little bit more fulfillment. And this video is to help me get a bit of clarity on my own thoughts and also to help someone who may be in, this, in a similar situation that I was a few years ago. Like it says in the tin, I'm currently on a mountain in Colombia, near a small town called Minca, staying in a hut, and it's lovely. But my mind is restless, and I want to talk about some things that I've been thinking about for a little while now. So, out of all the things in my life, I think my job has brought me the most misery and the most suffering. Being a doctor is one of those jobs which sounds really cool and awesome, but I think the reality of it is very different to what people assume. So I studied in the UK, I worked for a couple of years in the NHS, and for those two to three years that I was working in the NHS, I'd say I was probably at my peak of my misery. Now it's been a while since I worked there, so I'm trying to remember why I was so miserable. And I think there were a few reasons. Firstly, the NHS is it's a wonderful thing, providing free healthcare to everyone who lives in the UK. But unfortunately, it's so under-resourced, it's so understaffed, it's a beautiful place, but it's a miserable place to work in. In some ways, I was really envious of all my friends who worked in London, in the city, and even though they had probably quite poor work-life balances as I did, at least they were being financially rewarded for it. I remember there was times where I was being paid, especially my first year, less than a Domino's pizza delivery driver on the hour. This and the fact that I was really overworked, overstressed, emotionally drained, just meant that I was living a life that I really hated. And I just couldn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life. When I looked towards my senior colleagues, they didn't particularly live lives that I wanted to live. You're probably thinking, if I hated my job so much, why didn't I just quit? There's a couple of reasons. There's one, the sunk cost fallacy, where you feel you put so much time and energy into something that you need to continue it. Um, otherwise, that time would just go to waste. Secondly, people always would say that it gets better and better. Once you get to this certain level in your career, or once you make X amount of money, things will get better. Or maybe even once you retire, things will be better. So you work your, your whole life, and once you've retired, you can then be happy. So I started looking forward towards retirement, but it was so far away. It was 50 years away. And around this time, I came across a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Workweek. Absolutely ridiculous title, no one can work for four hours a week. But there were some ideas in there that really kind of changed my perspective on things. And one concept he talks about is, instead of saving it all for the end, taking mini retirements throughout your life instead. And when you think about it, there's no real reason you can't do this. Certainly it's not the thing that most people do, and it's unusual, but the only difference is you're taking pockets of your money and you're spending them throughout your life rather than spending it all at the end. And not just your money, your time as well. And I guess along those same lines, the patients that I met in hospital who worked their whole life and died shortly after they retired. It's not like that just happened once. I, I have met multiple patients in my life that, that has happened to. So you could save it for later, but there may never be a later. So after I finished my couple years working in the NHS, I finished my foundation year. So if you're in the States, that's similar to your internship years, there's quite a natural career break. And I decided I wanted to take a mini retirement in that time. So I spent six months traveling Southeast Asia. And honestly, 
it was one of the happiest periods of my life ever. And I know it sounds super dramatic, but I remember thinking at that time, if I died, if I were to suddenly die, I would be able to die without any regrets. I felt like I had lived my life to the fullest and that I had gotten enough out of it. Looking back now, there's definitely a few more things that I need to do. There's definitely a few more things I would like to do before kicking the bucket, as, you, as they say. But at that time, I was genuinely happy with what I'd achieved. But of course, it had to come to an end. The money saved up for those couple of years of working. The money would run out at some point and I would have to go back to work and earn some more money. I'd have to come out of retirement. So I went back to the UK. I started earning again. I started working as a locum. For those of you who don't know what a locum is, a locum is kind of like a substitute teacher, but a substitute doctor where you're filling in roster gaps in hospitals where they're short staffed. It usually means you travel around a lot filling in these hospital gaps but the hospital that I was working in in my foundation year, my final foundation year, was so short-staffed all the time. They always had roster gaps, so I could always get work there. And I did certainly come back from my travels feeling refreshed, and I was in a lot better place mentally. And I had a big realisation at this time, which was the best doctors are the happy doctors. The doctors who are enjoying their job, who are enjoying their lives, are the ones that can really show up for their patients, who can have empathy, who can give the best treatment. I'm not saying that miserable or sad doctors can't be good doctors, they certainly can. And I've met many, but in general, the happiest doctors are the best doctors. When I was doing my locum work back in the UK, I was still very lost. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a doctor, but I wasn't specializing in anything. So most people go into a training pathway after they've completed their foundation years, but there was nothing that was really calling to me. And the NHS was still a horrible place to work for, still super under-resourced, still felt super undervalued. But luckily at this time, I had a good friend, one of my best friends actually reached out to me, who was also a doctor and he had been working in Australia. He kept going on about how good it was, the weather, the money, the girls. It was like something from an in-betweeners movie. And I didn't really have anything else going on, so I made the jump. He got me a job in an emergency department and I was still at this period of my life where I was unsure whether medicine or being a doctor was for me. After starting work in Australia, for some reason, something just shifted. And for the first time, I started actually really enjoying my job. I wasn't crazy about it, but I could see myself doing it. I had come across this rule, which I call the 50% rule. I, don't, I have no idea where I got this from. I don't know if I made it up myself or if I got it from someone else, probably just got it from someone else. But my rule was that as long as I was happy 50% of the time, that was enough. Completely impossible to be happy 100% of the time. It's definitely an attainable goal to be happy 50% of the time. Um, we still need to make room for all the other emotions in life, all the pain and the suffering. But I think 50% of the time is something good to aim for. And for the first time, I was happy more than 50% of the time. And I'm not really sure why I enjoyed it so much more in Australia. I think partly it was the, the respect for doctors in Australia, the respect from the general population, the fact that you're financially compensated for your work, the fact that you don't feel like you're being put under the gun continuously. Maybe it was even just the lovely sunshine. I don't know, but I really enjoyed it. I was now in a better place. So I continued this for a full year working in the emergency department. I really enjoy working in the emergency department, but at the same time, shift work. Shift work is one of the worst things that you can put your body through, unfortunately. Um, being sleep deprived, constantly changing your sleep schedule. And I just could not see myself doing it long term. So I started working towards another thing, which was GP, general practice, or family medicine, you call it in America. I started working down that path of getting all the prerequisites for GP. So GP in Australia is, you, is usually three years training, but you can knock off a year of your training if you do certain hospital rotations. So I was doing all these hospital rotations, like pediatrics, general medicine, general surgery, had already done my emergency time. And I did that for a full year. Then I discovered locum again, but this time locuming in Australia, which was even better money, even more flexibility. And it meant I got to fly around Australia, working in different emergency departments across the country. And the pay was just so darn good. I'd already got a pay rise from moving to Australia, but now my pay as a locum was even more than what it was when I was working as a full-time um, salaried doctor. 
In fact, my pay was even more than some consultants in the UK. So a consultant is someone who's completed all the training. They're specialized in something in the hospital, whether that's surgery or medicine or GP. I was earning more money as a kind of junior doctor who was unspecialized as a locum than a lot of consultants back in the UK. But then again, I noticed something. I noticed I was being sucked down this kind of chasing money, materialistic lifestyle, which was quite new to me. Perhaps it was from living in Brisbane, perhaps it was just the people I was hanging around, but having money was, and earning money was becoming higher and higher up on my agenda. And I became preoccupied with kind of getting up the food chain, jumping back on that treadmill and ultimately joining the rat race again. But one of my favorite quotes from a rapper of all people called Lil Dicky, which is, when you be racing them rats, you ain't be making them raps. And what essentially he's saying is he was also part of the corporate world himself. He was working up that food chain. But when you, have, when you put so much time into your work, you don't have time to do anything else that's important to you. For Lil Dicky, rapping was important to him. And now he's a world famous, amazing rapper. And for me, I wasn't making my raps. I wasn't, I wasn't doing other things that I wanted to do. For example, working out, creating, creating videos like this. Creating videos is to me is what rapping is to Lil Dicky. Don't get me wrong, I like the emergency department. I like working as a doctor. I'm obsessed with health, but I know emergency isn't my true calling and I'm not gonna go down the emergency specialization route. I think now is a good time to enter my fiance. So I had met my fiance a couple years prior to this and the first thing that we bonded over was a mutual love for travel. We had both done our own solo trips in Asia, for me in Southeast Asia and for her in Central and South America. And right from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to travel together. But I started honoring something that had been super important to me, which is making these videos. And I'm so grateful to have found someone who has the same values as me because we've been able to do this trip and at the same time, I've been able to make these videos. So I'm kind of honoring two things that are really important to me at the same time. I think it's starting to rain a little bit. And I'm not really making any money from these videos, but I really feel a sense of direction. I know exactly what I want to do, and that is to specialize in some kind of preventative and lifestyle medicine, and at the same time, work online, make videos, help people through this medium. And I don't think I would have ever come to this conclusion if I hadn't taken my mini retirements throughout my life. Just having space away from work, space to think and reflect on what I actually want. If you're working 80% of your life, you focus all your time and energy into something, it's hard to assess what you really want. You only really can tell through having empty space. And a lot of people would think this is absolutely ridiculous, taking an extended period of time off like this especially people from my parents or our parents' generation, where you go to work, you work for your whole life, and then you retire at the end. Having a mini retirement throughout your life is just unheard of for a lot of them, and frankly, reckless, irresponsible, and stupid. Thankfully, my parents are quite accepting and supportive of my and our decision to do this, um, probably because they are big travelers themselves, even if it is just in short stints in small holidays. But you have to understand, we can't follow the blueprint of our parents anymore because they lived in different times to us. And times are changing so fast. The world is changing so fast. What our parents did doesn't necessarily apply to us anymore. And before I go on any further, I want to acknowledge my privilege and express my gratitude for my privilege. I'm lucky to have been born in a country, born to the right parents, gone to the right school, have the money to afford a higher education degree, be in a situation where I can do something like this. And I'm fully aware that there's people who are watching this video, people who live in a less developed country, people from the Philippines or any of these other countries I've visited, and they would never be able to do anything like this simply because they are living paycheck to paycheck and they would never be able to accrue enough savings to just leave, leave their job. Or there's the mother of two children, the single mother of two children who has mouths to feed and she can't take the risk of 
pursuing her passions because if she doesn't work and earn money, her kids don't eat. So I appreciate that I'm privileged to be doing something like this and not everyone can. But you have to ask yourself, if you're unsure if you're one of these people, is it just another bullshit obstacle that you're putting in front of yourself? Or is it actually true? Is you taking a risk of moving to a job that you want to try or going traveling or starting a business that you wanted to start, is that really going to put you and your loved ones at risk? And it's not for me to ask you, it's for you to ask yourself. And who knows, I might be wrong about this. And if you think I'm wrong, you can tell me in the comments. That's, that's absolutely fine. I'm open to discuss what I think is quite an important topic. But I guarantee there's at least one person watching this video who has a similar background to me, similar financial situation, similar level of education, who is too afraid to take a risk and too, af too afraid to do something that they've always wanted to do. Someone who felt stuck or trapped like I was, living a miserable life, thinking that when they make X amount of money, when they get to a certain level in their career, that they're going to be happy. They keep <coughs> getting quite emotional about this, but they keep putting it off and putting it off, thinking that later is the time to do it, when later may never come. And it's not just about traveling or not working. It's about taking the leap to do something that you really want to do, that you're passionate about. Trying something that you don't have time for because your job takes up 80% of your life. And if you're genuinely happy in your job or your life situation, good for you. You've won the lottery. Keep doing what you're doing. You're lucky. You're one of the lucky ones who has created a life that they already like. But if, if you're slightly unsure, if you're not happy 50% of the time, if you're not happy at least 50% of the time, you need to do some serious thinking and reflecting. I think people are more worried about how their CV looks than their life looks. But the most important first step into a healthy, happier life is finding the right job. And just quickly, if you're worried about what future employers might think in an interview when they ask you what you did when you, in your time off, whether that was traveling or pursuing a business idea that you've always wanted to do, just tell them, I wanted to give something everything I've got and it didn't work out. That's fine. And if they still don't give you the job because of your little break in your CV, Ask yourself, would you even want to be working for that person anyway? Would you want to be employed by a person who's so closed and narrow-minded that they didn't appreciate your desire to pursue something that was important to you? It's so important to not be miserable. And I can say with certainty that I'm now not miserable more than 50% of the time. That's a double negative. I can say with certainty I'm happy more than 50% of the time. And even if I don't make it to retirement, touch wood, that I will, at least I've tasted it. I could literally die now without any regrets. Except there are a couple more things on my bucket list. One of those is making a YouTube video which gets a million views. And one of those is being a dad. And having this mini retirement has given me some direction in my life. It has helped me understand what I really like, what's really important to me. And I really want to share this quote with you from Naval Reg from Naval Ravikant, he's an angel investor. He's also a huge forward thinker. And he said, the only real test of intelligence is getting what you want out of life. I know so many smart people, especially going to medical school, especially some of my colleagues who are miserable, who are not getting what they want out of life. And it's not because they're not intelligent, they obviously are, but they're either very risk averse or, or just afraid, afraid to step outside the box and do something different because someone else might be judging them. They are probably even just judging themselves. And before I go, I want to tell you something. There's two types of prison in this world. There's a physical prison, and there's something much, much worse, which is a mental prison, which I was in for a long time. So many people are unknowingly shackled to a life they hate and are miserable because of this. But here's the good news. You have the key.